from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The crisis in Ukraine is turning to fears about a food crisis for developing countries. And now the Biden administration is stepping in to help. That's as we show you what it's like right now to farm on the front lines in Ukraine. It's been unfortunate for all of us. Basically, everything has shut down and we aren't working. Light is vital for plants to grow, but can it be a key in destroying weeds? Weather extremes, from flooding to being buried under snow, North Dakota farmers are snowed in just as they are getting ready to plant. We actually had our drill hooked up, ready to go seed on uh, Monday uh, before this snowstorm hit. And in John's world? Wind energy woes. Well, we have a lot of news to get to this week, starting off with the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and growing concerns about a possible food crisis worldwide. And it's prompting both the White House and USDA to make some major announcements this week, one dealing with food aid. First, the White House is calling on Congress to provide an additional $500 million in aid to U.S. farmers. The money would be used to help boost crop production of things like wheat and soybeans, crops that it says are experiencing a global shortage due to the war. The aid would involve higher loan rates and crop insurance incentives to provide producers greater access to credit and lower the risk for farmers producing it. The other part of the equation, getting food to people right now. It's prompting USDA to tap into resources left untouched since 2014. USDA announcing a drawn down of the full balance of the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust. The agency saying it will use the trust's $282 million to get U.S. food commodities to countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, and Sudan. Those are all countries that have relied in the past on wheat imports from Ukraine. Well, the beef industry taking center stage in Washington this week as two hearings were held, both in the House Ag Committee as well as the Senate Ag Committee. In the Senate, legislators debated the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act of 2022, as well as the Meat and Poultry Special Investigator Act of 2022. Now, under the Price Discovery Act, which has bipartisan support, there would be a requirement for minimum purchase levels by packers. It would also establish up to seven regions where minimum levels of fed cattle buys must be made through approved pricing. But as we have reported, a recent Texas A&M study found the latest version of the bill would cost producers even more than an earlier estimate of $112 million over five years. And it says the mandate would have regional disparities. The cost to cattle producers are not all born equally. Some regions will be more heavily impacted than others. Nearly 90% of the economic cost of this bill are estimated to be borne by farmers in Kansas, Southern Plains, including Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. A fair market value is what a willing seller will pay and what a willing buyer We'll take for it. The part we always forget is when they're not under duress. Well, name me a person now that's selling cattle in this complex we have now that's not under duress. And it was leaders from the four big meat packing companies across the U.S. that were also in the hot seat this week. Lawmakers heard from producers, including the president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Then it was the meat packers' turn, with representatives trying to get the company leaders to explain what's going on with prices, packer margins, as well as issues in the industry. Now imagine waking up every single day and knowing that the cattle that you've birthed, fed, and raised are not going to make you any money because there isn't enough room in the rig system for the small cattle farmer to make a buck. The share of the retail dollar, the complete disconnect from the farmer to the grocer, is what's bankrupting the farmers and ranchers. Then it was the meat packers' turn, with representatives trying to get the company leaders to explain what's going on with prices, packer margins, as well as issues in the industry. We acknowledge that the rising price of many goods, including food, poses significant challenges for consumers worldwide. The price for meat is not immune to the global factors that are causing inflation. Supply and demand, labor constraints, transportation challenges, and rising feed costs add even greater pressure, and it all leads to increased prices at retail. We had that anomaly during COVID that drove this, but the biggest factor we have today is over supply of cattle relative to industry capacity. Um, but that's changing, and we're already seeing it change. 
Uh, as we look forward from here, we're going to see cattle prices go up, and we're going to see the beef profit for packers go down. The profit's going to shift back to the cattle production segments. Well, biofuels is part of the climate solution. That's according to EPA Administrator Michael Regan. Agritalk's Chip Flory speaking to Regan this week, asking him about the renewable fuel standard and a plan by EPA to deny all pending small refinery exemptions. You know, we're, we're still uh, looking at that decision, and I believe that um, we need to be on course to grow biofuels in this country. And so when we look at some of these exemptions, it's our opinion and it's the court's opinion that these exemptions have not been done appropriately in the past. And we look forward to making the right calls as we move forward. Regan says the EPA does plan to still set RFS levels by the June 3rd deadline set by a court decision. Well, USDA is upping its fight to stop the spread of avian influenza. USDA saying the virus has now been confirmed in 29 states, affecting more than 33 million birds. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack announcing the transfer of nearly $263 million from the Commodity Credit Corporation to APHIS, the agency's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. The money will allow APHIS to continue working with state and local partners to quickly identify and address cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the U.S. That's it for the news. Well, coming up, Planting forecast is really a mixed bag right now. We'll have a check of that with Matt Yurisovic next. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Yurisovic. Matt, another week and another snor snowstorm for North Dakota. They went from desperately wishing for rain just a few weeks ago to now wanting the spigot to really shut off in some areas of the state. But will that wet weather pattern really work its way farther south in the plains? Yeah, Ty, and it is going to work its way farther to the south, but we do want to start with that drought monitor, a new drought monitor coming out uh, this past Thursday showing we got some improvements there in parts of the northern plains there, especially in the Dakotas. We've seen a lot of improvement after not one, but two winter storms over the past couple of weeks. Now they really want that to shut off for just a little bit and hopefully all that snow melts nice and slow so we don't have any flooding concerns up in that area. But down to the south, places like Texas to Oklahoma, uh, western parts of Kansas and even New Mexico, very, very dry. We've got extreme to exceptional drought conditions that are persisting there and even back in places like the San Joaquin Valley where we, we really need that rainfall. We've seen the mountains snow, but we need a lot more. And unfortunately, it looks like it's going to stay pretty dry through the southwest as we head through this week. So here's a look at the jet stream, and this will kind of tell the tale of that kind of moving that more active pattern kind of dipping down into the plains. A couple of short waves moving through one that could bring some higher elevation snow back to the west still with those cooler temperatures in those higher elevations, likely above 10 or 12,000 feet. And then as we head through uh, really Thursday of this upcoming week, the system moving through the center of the country likely to bring some rain down through the plain states it still could cause some delays there with any planting that is currently going on, but it doesn't look like we've got any cold shots of air. Just a couple of upper lows swinging through, bringing us some much needed precipitation in uh, parts of the lower 48 where we really need it. So here's our surface map for Monday, May 2nd, staying warm in the lower half of the United States. We've got this storm system here that's going to wrap up some showers and thunderstorms out ahead of it right through the middle part of the country, but again, staying warm and dry back to the southwest while another system moves in to the Pacific Northwest and another low moving up the coast could bring some scattered showers as it moves its way off the eastern seaboard. Here's a look at Wednesday, May 4th. We've got cold front dipping through. It'll be mild here still in the Great Lakes, but mostly dry on Wednesday. We'll watch this system moving eastward, though, to bring them more rain heading into Thursday and then this through the center of the country on Wednesday. Showers and thunderstorms. Another dry line setting up to the south, though. Again, that battle for moist air to the east and very dry and windy conditions back to the west could keep fire danger in play there in the southwest, even through pretty much all of next week. Another system moving into the Pacific Northwest, staying warm and mild, though, all across the country as things start to settle down heading into next weekend. Here's a look at the temperatures this week below average, where we've got some precip moving into the west and up here into the Great Lakes and Northern Plain states, and then above normal down by the south. It's going to be very warm down there. Precipitation this week below normal, only in a few spots above normal, though. We're going to be dealing with a lot of rain as we head through this week. Time. Thanks, Matt.
Indonesia announced a ban on palm oil exports just over a week ago, and it sent soybean oil futures surging to record highs. But is it a supply crisis or simply a political play? Pete Meyer and Treg Cronin join me for the Marketing Roundtables next. Joining us now for our Marketing Roundtables, we have Peter Meyer of S&P Global Commodity Insights, as well as Treg Cronin, who is a grain farmer as well as a grain analyst. All right, Pete, start us off. Big announcement from the White House this week, asking Congress for more aid for Ukraine. But there are some other announcements possibly tied to that, including increasing commodity loan rates for two years, some other things that to incentivize producers maybe to grow more wheat and soybeans and other crops like that. But at the end of the day, are we running out of some of these commodities? No, I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. But I think when we, when we look at what's happened in Ukraine, and the longer that the situation in Ukraine drags on, what we do is we've created a an, an underlying support for the market until such time where we can balance uh, supply and demand. And in our opinion, that probably lasts you know two or three years because this is not a one year phenomenon what's happening in Ukraine. As sad and unfortunate a situation as it is, we also have a tremendous amount of reconstruction that has to go on there. So we think that that. What, what that equates to is probably two or three years of very, very supportive markets. That's not necessarily just bull run markets, but we can easily make a fundamental case for, for a base price of $6 corn and $15 beans until such time when the veg oil situation, as well as the corn situation and wheat situation out of Ukraine get stabilized. Well, Treg, speaking of that, it's that situation that prompted the White House, uh, you know, to, to call for this. But when you see the government intervene this early on, in the season, what type of unintended consequences can it actually create in commodity markets? Yeah, great point, Tyne. I mean, I think the, the headline number of, you know, 400, 500 million dollars, whatever the, the total package ends up being, grabbed a lot of attention. But now that we've seen some details start to trickle out, uh, I've, I've, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that, that it's going to result in, in a flood of, of extra grain production um, that, that you know, some might think uh, out of the White House. So uh, what's what's important to realize, too, is that we're, we're sitting here just, you know, calendars just about to turn to May. So there's there's limited things that farmers can do at this stage. And, and so much is weather dependent, uh, you know, to really ramp up production uh, to the degree that that many think is necessary. So um, of the details I've seen, I think that the impact is in terms of increased production is going to be somewhat limited. Um, and uh, to Pete's point, you know, I think that this is the market's doing its job of, of, of incentivizing additional production. I don't know that these measures from the White House are going to do anything that the, the, the board prices are not doing on their own. So um, and, and any time, uh, as you kind of suggested, we get a, a big government program thrown out. The unintended consequences piece of it uh, probably is going to, to play more so than, you know, the, the additional bushels that we might be able to count on. Well, one thing I would add, Tyne, is that, you know, when you when you throw money, you know, you can't fight inflation by printing more money. And when exactly. you when, when you throw money at the at the farmer, I mean, the unintended consequences, in my opinion, would be continued high input prices. I mean, the seed guys did not participate in this in this rally because they set their prices in the fall. You start throwing more money at the farmer or at the ag sector. Certainly your prices for inputs are not going down. Well, at the same time, you know. Treg mentioned that really you know, farmers are incentivized to plant this year when you look at prices. So prevent plant may not even be in the picture for some of those areas that are getting moisture. When you look back over history and in these years where North Dakota doesn't really get in the field until the middle of May, we've had several over the last 20 years. And in those years, we've seen 800,000 to 2 million acres of prevent plant um, pretty commonly. But I think that this year uh, there have been some rule changes with RMA uh, with regard to haying and grazing, um, and the board prices, they're, they're higher than they've ever been, you know, at this stage of the spring. And so every incentive is there to plant. And so whether that happens a week from now, or it happens in the middle of June, I don't think we're going to have a lot of fallow acres uh, in North Dakota. Um, but but the patterns, there's no, there's no question between the snowfall, the last couple of weeks, and the rain that, that we're getting in, in the Dakotas today and this weekend, uh, we're, we're several weeks out from a lot of progress in North Dakota specifically. So uh, I think you could see a big shift there 
from spring wheat to corn. If it gets later than that, corn to soybeans. If it gets later than that, then maybe we're soybeans into sunflowers. Um, but there are options yet, but spring wheat could be the big loser here. All right, we need to take a quick break and then we have a lot more to talk about when we come back. Well, EPA Administrator talked to Chip Flory earlier this week about biofuels role in climate initiatives from the White House, but wind energy is also a focus for the administration and it's creating some wind energy woes. Here's John Phipps. Opponents of wind energy may be encouraged by the financial difficulties of that industry. For the first time in several years, wind-generated electricity costs are rising after years of being driven lower by new technology and competition. Wind giants like Bestas, GE, and Siemens are facing losses as they struggle with several simultaneous and familiar issues. Beginning in 2010, the build-out of wind farms looked to be on a solid track, and with the economics of wind turbines promising, many countries started lowering their subsidies. They're starting to feel that now. At the same time, new research and much more operating data helped designers push turbine size, efficiency, and productivity to new levels. Thanks to much larger machines, wind turbines need not seek the highest wind speed areas, as newer turbines produce with less than 10 mile an hour breezes. These advances did not come cheaply, however, and manufacturers kept pushing the envelope to build ever larger machines. The breakdown of the supply chain devastated turbine production just as this push was starting. At the same time, China's new emphasis on infrastructure has leaders looking inward to supply the construction of new wind farms within China, decreasing their exports of crucial components. Meanwhile, in the U.S. and to a lesser extent elsewhere, the permitting process has made planning new capacity more expensive and time-consuming. This is another huge advantage for the Chinese, where no local or regional permission or even opinions for matter. Like their extensive high-speed rail system, engineers just determine the best route, and that's where it gets built. A planned wind farm in my area was essentially scuttled by remarkably stringent siting regulations, for example. For fossil fuel fans and investors, especially coal, this may seem like good news. But the slowdown in renewable energy development suggests higher oil and coal prices. Meanwhile, greenhouse gas emission goals get pushed farther and farther into the future. This promises a financial collision with the enormous numbers of com companies and governments that have loudly committed to zero emissions. But this is not just a two-player game. The economics of solar, a massive rollout of electric vehicles, and differing outlooks for specific fuels like natural gas and oil promise investor headaches and forecaster frustrations. Thank you, John. Well, when we come back, Machinery Pete, he has tractor tails this weekend. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're going to visit with a tractor enthusiast in Virginia who has a Gibson E. I went out there to buy a Gibson SC. The gentleman had this tractor, and after some conversation, money exchanged hands, and I came home with two. Now, he had another one that I would have preferred, and I want to say it was an I, but he would not part with that one. The SC was the D, and then they had the S, SC or SD. They were small tractors, and this one was the next one up in their uh, lineup of horsepower. This is as I bought it. The gentleman that had it restored it, and it looked fine for the museum here. So I've left it just like it is. Uh, haven't done anything to it. Haven't even put a new battery in it. It's going to stay here until either the museum is sold or it's just going to stay here as long as it needs to be. I have no plans of selling the tractor. It runs fine. It's, it's, a, it's a Wisconsin engine in it. It runs like a Wisconsin engine. It makes that the old hay baler noise, and it runs fine. Once it gets started up, it runs fine. I ran around here quite a bit up until a few years ago when I stopped starting them. That would be the only thing that's not normal on is the lights. Otherwise, it's as it came from the, as it was manufactured. Now, they made two models of this particular tractor. 
one with a wide front end, and this one's a tricycle. Thank you, Greg. And we do have a Tractor Tales playlist now on our Farm Journal YouTube page. Just scan that code on your screen and it will take you right there. Well, as we've discussed on the show, farmers in Ukraine are pushing to plant, even if it means wearing bulletproof vests and staying alert of debris and even missiles in fields. We'll show you what it's like farming on the front lines next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, Ukraine and Russia combined produce about a quarter of the world's wheat supplies. And as Ed Lavandera shows us, farming on the front lines in Ukraine is anything but easy right now. Serhii Yaichuk runs a one-man dairy operation. He has six cows on a little farm just 15 miles from the front lines of the battlefield in southern Ukraine. But neither Russian soldiers or falling rockets have stopped the 49-year-old from tending to his work. That is Sergei's house there just in the distance and there is an unexploded rocket that landed this close. Landed here about a week ago. Did you hear that rocket land? Everything happened before my eyes. The explosions erupted all around him when this strike hit. Russian rockets often target his village of 500 people. We were covered with dust, just dust and shrapnel all the way here. I fell to the ground, crawling, not feeling my legs or arms. It was scary. For those who have not gone through this, you would not believe it. Sergei keeps one eye on his herd and the other eye on the war. So these are Sergei's six dairy cows. And if you notice, he has them spread out. He wants to separate them so they don't all get killed in one strike. He must keep the cows alive. This is the life of a farmer in Ukraine. Maxim Krivenko and his family grow the traditional Ukrainian crops of wheat and sunflower on these lush, wide open fields near the village of Yavkine. But the war has upended his business. It's been unfortunate for all of us. Basically, everything has shut down and we aren't working now. Maxim says the cost of fuel and grain seeds have skyrocketed. It's difficult to find parts to repair farm machinery. He's supposed to plant this year's wheat crop in the coming weeks, but if the fighting returns to this land, it won't happen. So this is the storage area where they keep their sunflower seeds but they haven't been able to sell it because of the war. Maxime is also stuck with an entire season sunflower seed harvest. It just sits in this storage space. Will this war kill your business? <laughs> it's already killed it. We have stockpiled our wheat production and our sunflowers, but we aren't able to sell them. So I would say it is the beginning of the end. Ukraine is considered the world's breadbasket, along with Russia, producing 30% of the world's wheat exports. The United Nations says this war is creating a food production crisis not seen since World War II. Thousands of Ukrainian farmers now find themselves on the front lines of this war, and their growing fields of wheat and sunflower have been turned into debris fields for missiles and rockets and other explosives. The wreckage of recent battles still sit in the farm fields. The body of a Russian soldier is buried next to this ammunition supply truck. Farm or fight is the choice facing frontline farmers. Serhii Yaychuk has already faced this life and death decision. When the Russians invaded this village last month, Serhii joined the fight. He was shot in the shoulder. Oh, wow. If the Russians come back, do you want to fight again? What else can we do? I'll take my pitchfork and go fight. I will defend my village until the end. When the war returns, the harvest will have to wait. Well, Pete Meyer and Drake Gronin already talked about the wider impact on global grain supplies, but we'll get into the discussion even more when we come back. It's time to sign up for the 2022 United Pork Americas Conference in Orlando, Florida. Register today at unitedporkamericas.com and join us September 7th through the 9th. Welcome back, Peter Meyer, as well as Treg Cronin, joining us again 
Peter, we just saw what it's like to farm on the front lines in Ukraine right now. Just some unimaginable situation for farmers there. But as you look at how it's impacting global supplies, a little over a week ago, we have Indonesia that came out and said they are banning palm oil exports. But is it due to issues with palm oil and worries about supply? Or do you think this may be actually a political play? Um, we're, we're really not sure because the Indonesian government has changed their mind on this two or three times, right? There's no question that the veg oil market has has really, really tightened quite a bit, as we can see with with uh, uh, soy oil prices at record highs, 85, 85 cents a pound currently. But let's look a little bit deeper into what's going on in, in Indonesia. First off, palm oil exports are 3% of Indonesia's, Indonesia's GDP, right? So while we understand certainly that food security has become a global concern, you can't really, you can't really cut off 3% of your GDP. The other thing is that the palm oil market, as most vegetable oil markets are, given, given the situation in Ukraine, are in an inverted market. Why would you stop selling into an inverted market if you want to bring income into your country? This may be a political ploy to raise export tariffs, to, to be able to, um, to disseminate the funds amongst, uh, amongst people that aren't, aren't doing too well in the country. We certainly understand that. But regarding stopping the stopping the um, the palm oil harvest at the moment, you just can't do that. So, in other words, the fruit keeps coming in; it keeps coming in. If you stop harvest, it damages the trees, and the fruit also has a finite uh, amount of time where it can sit without being without being crushed. So, this is a situation that, and I don't mean to put a pun in here, but this is a situation that's very fluid. The government seems to change their mind every few every few weeks. We've seen three or four changes on this. And just stopping it and being able to store, or if not stopping the harvest, being able to store the product just seems impossible to us. Well, Treg, after that announcement came out over a week ago, and then again, we saw more news this week. We had soy oil re, you know, go to record high levels. We saw corn prices hit a 10-year high. I mean, we are continuing to see this fuel in this commodity market. And at this point, do you think there is enough with weather issues and other concerns around the world that that fuel will continue short term? Short term, I don't think there's any question because we've got to get into the growing season in the United States because uh, while we've got issues in the in the Black Sea, uh, Indonesia, as you mentioned, um, I mean, like it or not, the, the growing season in the U.S. is going to con you know dominate here the next 30 to 60 days uh, until we get some confidence um, in the, in the U S corn crop, U S soybean crop. Um, but you know, back to what Pete was just mentioning. And, and I think that what, what fuels or can fuel this fire globally right now is this sense of, um, nationalism where, you know, when, when prices are low and, and, and trade is free flowing, um, you know, the question of suspending exports, doing things like that, taking those measures, it's not even a thought, but then one domino tips over, and then it seems like it, it becomes easier and easier. And as we saw right after the conflict broke out, uh, you know, there were some Eastern European countries threatening to ban exports. Now you've got Indonesia and it, it, it becomes that much easier um, to do that. But what, what many don't see is short term, they might think they're making the right move domestically, but globally, it's, it's going to be a much bigger problem. If everybody starts uh, restricting exports, banning exports, it just exacerbates the problem. And so I hope that Cooler heads do prevail, uh, especially as as Pete just mentioned, um, when the economic incentive is is there to, to just export as much as possible. But when you throw issues like that in, when you when you have to have weather premium for the U.S., uh, it's I hate to say it, but it's difficult to see uh, why we'd have a material setback here in the in the short term, um, barring some you know unforeseen financial collapse uh, outside of the grain market's control. Pete, speaking of that. There's a lot of moving parts globally right now. But here in the U.S., as we shift our focus to domestic production, what type of yield do we need to hit in order to be comfortable with supplies? Or how far below trend line do you think that really traders get very nervous about U.S. supplies as well? Wow. You saved the easy question for me, huh? Mm -hmm. um, I, that's, that's a very tough question. I mean, I'm starting, the, I know the USDA's trend line is one, let's just talk about corn, for instance, 181. I mean, I'm going to start at 179 and see what happens. I think there's more corn acres coming than, than the USDA um, or that the NAS survey showed in the prospective plantings report. But um, yeah, I, I mean, there is, you know, 
I think that there is some room below trend line yield for both corn and beans, but not as much room as we would have had in, in years past, given the situation in Ukraine. All right. Peter, thank you so much for joining us, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. A lot of perspective this weekend that we truly appreciate. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Well, it's been a wet spring in many areas of the country, so that wet spring combined with issues of sourcing inputs could mean tough weed control this year. But as Clinton Griffiths shows us, scientists in Ohio believe that light could be the key in destroying weeds. This shower of chaff may be the future of weed control. So in terms of mechanical attachment, it's literally just going to be um, how it adapts and bolts in to the rear section. The team at Global Neighbor is using high intensity blue light and heat to kill weed seeds on their way through the combine. That's where we use short durations of light at high intensity to alter a plant's growth. We can make it die, we can make a weed seed not grow, or we can make that seed grow faster. It's an idea that started several years back. We got a small business investment research grant uh, from Edwards Air Force Base. They were trying to uh, control plant and defoliate plants without uh, using chemicals and not disturbing the desert crust. The target, tumbleweed seeds in the California desert. Then a farmer in Iowa heard about it and asked for help fighting water hemp. I think if you could do kill those, you could probably kill kill my seeds as well. We found if we warm the seed up to a certain temperature and then flood it with blue light, we can damage the, the cells that control the reticle growth and then therefore that seed won't become a plant. The team went to work creating a system that bolts onto the combine, destroying weed seeds on their way out the back. As the years go on, as you're putting less weed seed back into the field because more and more of them are becoming disabled. Blue light in smaller doses is also good at supercharging seeds. We also found if we dial back that blue but still warm up the seed, we can actually get the seed to get out of the ground faster. This was at two seconds, this was at five seconds, and over there you can see it was 10 seconds. And they're even looking at ways to build a system to replace chemicals for cover crop burn down. As you can see, there was some damage done uh, to the two second crop, but when you, by the time you get to the 10 second treatment, you can see that the ryegrass is, is dead. I'm, ama I'm amazed. It's so exciting. And the thing was, you could see that it was having a bad day right away, because what was happening is you could, it, it like it melts. Right idea using a blue light that one day soon may save farmers a little green during the growing season. Thanks, Clinton. Well, as John discussed last week, the jump in land prices, well, it's also creating a long list of concerns and it's spilling over into the cash rent debate. Customer support is next. Owners, renters in the future. Last week, we told you about Farmers National Company showing land values have jumped 20% just in the first quarter of this year. And as land values soar, cash rents are also increasing. Here's John Phipps. Questions like this are becoming more frequent. When I bought my farm many years ago, I felt if things went well, I could make payments. Today, it appears my sons don't have a chance. Have land and production prices outpaced income potential, and is this exclusive to agriculture? Have high land prices destined the United States to investor-owned land and us becoming a rental-based production agricultural economy? It seems this has happened in poultry and swine industries. And that's from Steve Borgman in Marshall, Missouri. Well, Steve, your point about poultry and swine is well taken. They are overwhelmingly concentrated largely due, I think, to the very small number of poultry and swine buyers and processors. Beef is similar, but only above the cow-calf producer level, that segment has resisted concentration for a number of reasons. 
There is no evidence investor ownership of farmland is more than a sliver or that it's growing. This is especially true of foreign investors who own less than 3% of all farmland and the vast majority by Canadians, Germans and Brits. As for domestic investors, this is harder to pin down. About 60% of farmland is owned by the farmer. This hasn't changed much over the years or quickly. Cropland is owned about or probably about 50% farmer owned and pasture land much higher. The non-farming owners are overwhelmingly farm related and usually family connected. Retired farmers and off-farm heirs make up a big chunk, but then it gets to be a matter of definition, a little vaguer, which is why there aren't precise numbers. For example, my brother, a physician, bought land for me to farm, but also as part of his investment portfolio. Is he an investor or a family farm member? Our ag industry is a remarkably stable mix of owners and renters. Since this has happened during widely different economic conditions, it will likely continue. Land and input prices have not squeezed profit margin nearly as much as competition. There are always farmers who can generate higher margins, so our continuing frustration is not so much with the system, but with our neighbors. The other factor is the decline of the need for labor due to technology. From my point of view, if our future looks worse due to whatever factors we choose, why are guys standing 10 deep behind me to rent or buy every one of my acres? We are not the only industry to be reshaped by the ascendance of capital, but like small retailers and small manufacturers, our transition makes many less sure economic efficiency is the be-all and end-all. Thanks, John. And you can hear more of John's commentary, especially customer support, by just scanning that QR code on the screen. It'll take you right to our YouTube page. All right, coming up next, farmers in North Dakota are buried in snow, but is it changing their planting plans for this year? That's from the farm next. Got equipment to sell privately, but tired of scams and hassles? Visit machinerypeat.com and click sell mine. Machinerypeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. Well, for farmers in North Dakota right now, spring planting seems like a long way away. That's as major winter storms have barreled across the state, and now farmers and planters are snowed in. From devastating floods in eastern North Dakota to snow piling up farther west, April has created two extremes. Well, the weather's been uh, a little bit strange. A state battling widespread drought last spring has seen a 180 degree turnaround just recently. That's as planting was just about to start. We were looking at a really early spring. In, in fact, we actually had our drill hooked up, ready to go seed on uh, Monday uh, before the snowstorm hit. Paul Thomas Farms in North Central North Dakota, where the week before Easter, the ground seemed primed to plant. And then all of a sudden we got hit with 40 inches of snow and uh, and it's, uh, it sure changed the outlook for spring's work. April snowstorms here aren't rare, but back-to-back -back blizzards and the cold has been extreme for even North Dakota. Probably the one thing different about this April storm than some in the past is we've stayed so cold since we've had the snow. So it, it, we're going on, you know, 12 days now, and we're still looking at major snow banks, fields, you know, 60, 70 percent covered with snow yet. Thomas says typically farmers here would be getting into the field to plant right now. We'll plant corn all the way out to about May 25th. Um, that's kind of our drop dead date. You know, we try and get it all in by May 10th to May 15th. And even with the window closing, he says he's not switching his planting plans just yet. Our plans for planting are, and seeding our small grains we're still, you know, going to stay with the same crop mix. I, you know, we'll see as how long this takes to see when it warms up. And his biggest concern right now is when and how all of this snow melts off. Our biggest concern is melting it off and then hopefully, you know, there's there's this situation where you have a perfect melt, where you have those 45, 50 degree days where you're moving some snow, you give it time to soak in, that it all doesn't run off. But if the area sees a big temperature swing, he knows there's some areas that may not be able to plant. And if we would happen to get one of those really warm days, you know, we'd see a lot of this snow just running off and filling up our potholes, 
uh, filling up some areas that we typically farm that we're not going to be able to farm those areas. Even with all the concerns, it's moisture that's sprouting optimism about what harvest could bring. The moisture, although it presents a lot of challenges for us, it certainly gives us that hope of a lot of opportunity for a good crop as well. Well, Thomas says last spring drought was the top concern and things didn't improve throughout the summer with grain production in his area cut by at least half due to the extreme dryness. Well, that snow made it brutal also for ranchers who were in the middle of calving season the past couple weeks. Next weekend on U.S. Farm Report, we'll introduce you to a ranch family who battled the blizzard with grit and grace. It's a story you won't want to miss during beef month. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to join us again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.